Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this afternoon I'm joined by Colin Watt. Colin, how long have you been with Axon now? Five years maybe? Uh, four, I think, yeah. Four, four years. Uh... Going for a testimonial. Yeah, um, plenty to talk about, Colin. Plenty to talk about. Uh, that will be interesting when we get to that testimonial kind of stage. Yourself, Kevin Graham, maybe do a joint testimonial. Uh, you maybe can't get that right far off yourself. Five and a half years coming up. Five and a half years on. Yeah. No, six years in June or July. I'll get the date exactly. We'll have a party. Jungle Lions quick off the mark. Today, a full-strength squad is frightening for every other Scottish club. Five subs suits this team to a T. Um, we are in the week of the League Cup final. Celtic will be playing Rangers at Hamden. And we're going in in good shape, Colin. Uh, none more so exemplified than the weekend's performance. Outstanding um, from start to finish. I mean, I was looking at that game. I was thinking to myself, Barry Robson's going to try and get a reaction out of the Aberdeen players. You know, they might rise to the occasion. Celtic blew them away. It was a brilliant yeah. performance. Yeah, I was on um, our good friend Glenn Schroeder's Red Tinted Glasses podcast, the Aberdeen podcast. Um, last week and we were talking about the game and the build-up to the game and we we're saying Aberdeen, basically if they play their attacking style of football then maybe you know it'll be an exciting game of football to watch but um, what can you say, we, you come out the gates flying and you put Aberdeen on the ropes and they never looked like recovering at any no. point um, apart from maybe Joe Hart giving us a wee bit of a scare in the second half when he wanted to come out and dance along the the halfway line at times, but um, no, I mean, it was a professional performance from Celtic. It was very polished. Um, could have been a lot more than four, let's be brutally honest. Um, and yeah, some good performances from a lot of players in the team. And you know what? I've, I say it, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It was an absolute steal to get Rio Hitati for 1.3 million. He must be the best versatile player to ever play. Well, you know this, Colin, right? Throughout the season, on a Celtic state of mind, we've been bigging up Rio Atate, not because we are some kind of oracles of football, just because we've got a pair of eyes in the back of our head and anyone with that can see how talented this guy is. At the beginning of the season, I don't get things right all that often, Colin, so when I do it, I kind of hold on to them. A bit like you with Luca Connell, I hold on to it. <laughs> Uh, what? Where is that oh, 20 quid? Where's what? that 20 quid, by the way? Where's that, what, hey, where's what that score? Goal? Well, for bigging me up, I'll give you it back. Um, what a goal he scored for Barnsley the other day. It the was way. quite the an first effort. Minute of the game, first mm -hmm. minute of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe we been a good move. Been a should good move for Luca. I don't think he would get into this team. Um, but anyway, yeah, banging on about Rio Atati, a couple of weeks back, we called him um, the most complete footballer at Celtic. I think you've just said that yourself uh, in your own words. And I think what we've been seeing now is a player who has actually developed from the guy who walked in the building last January. Um, and Anne says there's still development to come. That's a frightening yeah. prospect in itself, Colin. Yeah, I mean, listening to um, Ange after the game, it was really interesting to get an insight into what Rio Hatati's like, not on the pitch, but in the training pitch. Mm -hmm. Seeing that he comes into training and he's looking to get advice every single day on how to be a bit better than the day before. And that's, that's so encouraging for someone who's still so young as well. I mean, there is so much development, I think, to see from uh, Rio Hitati. And he's already catching the eye of the teams down south. I saw, I think it was a Liverpool fan who um, put a compilation together of all the sort of tricks and flicks that he's done so far this season and the, uh, the season before. But, I mean, it's not just the sort of things that catch the eye. It's the it's the dirty work as well. You see him and he's not scared to go in for a tackle. He's not scared to put himself about. He gets himself back. So as much as we enjoy, I mean, the, his second goal was one of the best goals of the season, to be perfectly honest, in terms of technical ability. Um, but there was moments in the game where he's back covering, he's putting that tackle in, he's winning the ball back. And... He is, as you say, he's a complete footballer. It's not just the sort of luxury, skillful player. He is that sort of hard-working individual. And he, for me, I mean, he's got to be first name on the team sheet at the minute. 
Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you, you were talking there uh, about the dirty work that he gets involved in. His work rate's unbelievable. Um, up there, we can kind of stand Petrov levels of work rate in the midfield. Yeah. Outstanding. Um, and when you look at his involvement, just even in the goals, the body movement, which creates the space for him to then get a shot in, because I like to call it getting a shot in, Colin, not getting a shot away. That's just far too much of this kind of left field chat for me. Uh, the quick feet for the third goal, where obviously he's combined with Callum McGregor to then play a, a one two, the movement to get the ball back, the control of the shot on both occasions, the passing ability. Um, I think he's the best in the country uh, by some distance at this moment in time. And he's going to be key uh, this weekend for the his second. No, this will be his first League Cup final. Yeah, so his first League Cup final yeah. because obviously he came uh, after the event last time round. I think he's going to be the key player, Colin. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's still other players in the team that I think will be pivotal to us being successful on um, on Sunday, um, including maybe some that didn't even play on Saturday. Um, I'd like to see if Aaron Moy will uh, come back to to play um, on Sunday. Hopefully he's not too badly injured. I think Andrew's saying he's going to return to training early this week. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Sir Cal McGregor, Jota had a great game, Maeda, um, even O, I thought O did very, very well for his first uh, start, put himself about, didn't go on the end of anything, but I mean, he was very influential in how we played. It means that you can afford maybe going forward to rest Kyogo and put O in and know that the, the sort of style of football doesn't change, which is, is great to see. Um and the likes of Cameron Carter Vickers, once again, absolutely solid performance. The man's been a, a revelation since he's came to Celtic. I think he's he's found his home now. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, there's there's so many different players that I think are going to be pivotal and they need to turn up on Sunday. Otherwise it's going to be a bit of a struggle. But Hatati has the ability to open up the game. Uh, you take a look at his goals, obviously fantastic, but then there's other things like his passing range. I mean, the fact that he found that pass to Jota, yeah, okay, he was offside, but that was a wonderful through ball. It splits yeah. open the defence completely. Mm-hmm. Um, so things like that, especially against a team who don't concede a hell of a lot of goals compared to the rest of the league. And it's going to be a very tight game. So you need players like that that have the creative ability to to change it. We're going to be speaking about all the players that Colin mentioned there. We're going to be chatting quite a bit about the League Cup final. Obviously, that is coming up on Sunday. That will be the day after Martin O'Neill uh, makes an appearance in Glasgow alongside myself, Colin, for a wee chat around his incredible football career with a focus on the Celtic chat. So I'm really looking forward to that. If anyone is coming to join us, hopefully I'll see you there at Banners Art and Design. Uh, Michael Teague, morning, not Teague, uh, morning, evening from Melbourne. Uh, who knows? Who knows who Teague was? Uh, remember all that carry on last year? Uh, Celtic Twitter, Colin. Oh. Bizarre place at times, a bizarre place. Um, Danielle, you're excited for Sunday, but Joe Hart's heart and mouth moments give me the fear. We were lucky it was Johnny Hayes that was at the end of his calamitous play. We need a new keeper for next season. We will be chatting about that. I didn't want to start off with Daniel in case uh, people out there thought we were being negative after a brilliant performance, but thanks for bringing it up. And I will be uh, covering that during the show as well. And Celtic follower on the YouTube, we need to keep them as far away from our box to avoid them falling over for penalties and free kicks. Where else in the world um, do you look ahead to a, a cup final Celtic follower with the officials in mind as a point of discussion. They shouldn't be a point of discussion, but they are because this is Scottish football, Colin, and we will be talking about them as well. Just before we move on, um, I've moved the angle of the camera so you can see a wee bit behind me here, and I've displayed a few Celtic-related mementos behind us here. Obviously, this jersey, um, that was the first time, believe it or not, that was the first time I physically saw Celtic winning a cup. 1995, that was the jersey we wore. That was Mike Mike Galloway's benefit game. Um, up in the corner there is Billy, Billy Connolly, uh, famous Celtic supporter. Um, the one above the Mike Galloway jersey is a primal screen poster. And that one in the middle is the Verve. What's the relevance of that, Colin? Um, trying to think. It's not the drugs don't work. Uh, what else would it be? It's not a sonnet. 
Is somebody lucky? Could be. Is Andrew a lucky man, perhaps? So I think that when you're talking about uh, all the the drama and the comedy that, that happens in and around Scottish football, um, I, I always just take it, you know, tongue in cheek, I always take it with a pinch of salt, Colin, but some people take things dead, dead seriously. And that's what's been happening in the lead up to this big one. There's one thing about Ansel, he's not going to be rattled by anybody, is he? Regardless of who says what, he's just going to go on about his business. It's like before we came on here, you and I were getting a catch up. I genuinely have no knowledge of various things that are happening elsewhere yeah. uh, because I don't have the time to check. And I think Ange's a wee bit like that. I mean, as I said, I think I've said it last week, I've maybe said it the week before. Um, Ange, this is a, as much as Ange has a connection to the team and to the club and understands what the club is all about, it's just a job. It's just a job. He goes in, he does his work, he goes home, and then he spends his time with his family. He doesn't get caught up in the goldfish bowl that is Scottish football. I mean, you saw him at the press conference there last week, head in his hands with the ridiculous questions that he gets asked time and time again. <laughs> um, admitting himself that he thought, he thought, sorry, um, that he should have just taken another week off. I mean, if anything's going to drag him out of Scottish football, it's going to be the way that the media kind of react to him. Because... They know they're getting absolutely nothing, yet they keep doing it time and time and time and time again. And I don't understand why. I mean, it's the symbolism of stupidity is to know that if something doesn't work, to keep trying it the same way again and again and again and hope for a different outcome. And yet that's what the Scottish press seems to do. So, like, I don't think Andrew will get caught up in it. You don't see him talking about other managers and Leicester's talking in a um, a good way about them. He, he is very complimentary of them. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't see him having a go at anybody. He just he's honest and he professional. I he's think professional. He's a big yeah, yeah, professional. And Absolutely. I don't think anything gets him. No, because I mean, some of the the behaviour is quite amateurish. I think Scottish football comes with a bit of humour. Um, and, and self-deprecating humour at times, I think, is is healthy in Scottish football. But when people start taking it all seriously, I mean, Ange Postacoglu, um took a week off and John Kennedy took the reins um, and that became an issue. That became a talking point. It was almost as if, where's Ange? He's running scared and all of that nonsense. Now, Paul Byrne is coming in because Paul actually predicted 4 nothing at the weekend uh, on the, the live chat on the YouTube channel. Unfortunately, I didn't have money on it, says Paul, so the milky bars are not on me. That will go over your head, Colin, because you're no old no, enough I remember to remember. That. You remember, I remember that? that? Yeah. Oh, nice one. Thank God I'm not the player, Paul Byrne. That was a scathing remark. Sorry, Paul. Having said that, he only remembers his two goals against him. I was a fan. I like Paul Byrne. We were in a time, really, in the early 90s where... Um, you know, we didn't have the same kind of level of player that we've got now. Uh, Liam Brady brought him over from Bangor, I think, for about 80 grand. And, you know, he paid that back with the two goals against Rangers. Jungle Line played against them in Dublin. Um, I still follow Paul on Facebook. And you know what? I think he'd be good to bring over for a wee event at some point. Or maybe even one of the ex-pros games, Colin. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, before my time. But, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, that definitely, if he's up for it, I'll bring him over. Callum McGregor, I want to talk about Callum because I think it was our very own Declan McConville who first coined um, the phrase that uh, Callum was Celtic's metronome. Uh, I think it was Declan. I've, I've now heard it being used by commentary, teams, etc. He scores the early goal against Aberdeen that kind of settles everything, Colin, and sets the scene for the uh, domination that we were going to have for the next 90 minutes. And for me, he is the epitome of this mantra that Ange has, uh, you know, created and instilled in the Celtic team of we never stop. He is, he is that man. Yeah, I mean, what was very um, important to see was that Celtic managed to retain the ball so well <laughs> in that first half. I think Aberdeen maybe get two, three touches and then it was straight back in their own half. It was right back in their face. Um, and we pinned them right in in that first half. And I, I got a text from Glenn, actually, um, after the second goal went in. And he said, this is going to be a long afternoon. And I can imagine what it would be like for the Aberdeen fans watching that first half because it was totally dominant. Um, 
McGregor being on the edge of the area, ready to put one away, that's exactly where you want someone like him to be. Um, you look at the amount of crosses that Celtic put in game after game, when the ball comes out, you want somebody to be on the edge of the area that's got the ability to put one away. I still think we don't take enough shots from outside the box. I think we still try and work a lot of it to go across the face of goal. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see us trying to put a couple of pop shots from the edge of the area. Um, we've definitely got the ability to do so. But, yeah, as you say, I mean, Cal McGregor, he is a massive, massive part of the success of this team. And we all sort of, well, I say we all, many of us were kind of questioning whether he'd be able to step up into the, the captain's role when Scott Brown departed. But he's done it so smoothly. It's almost as if the, the transition was so natural to him. And it, he's, he's just been, um, yeah, he's been fantastic for Celtic and for Ange, I'd have to say. Yeah, he definitely has. I mean, I remember there were um, eyebrows raised when Scott Brown became the captain of Celtic, Colin. If you think back to that, you know, Tony Mowbray make, making Scott Brown the captain of the, the, the football club. And um, some people didn't think he was well suited. He went on to become one of the most successful captains in the club's history. And then when Callum McGregor is touted to become the um, successor to Scott Brown, you know, the same people are maybe raising questions about that. He's proven beyond doubt that he's a brilliant captain. I remember the discussion. As I say, I don't always uh, get things right. I remember the discussion and I thought, Chris Ayer would have made a good captain at that time. But he had all the kind of leadership qualities. Um, not because I think your captain has to be at the back or a centre half or any of this kind of stuff, because I think it works regardless. Um, but yeah, Chris Ayer. And I, I think Carl McGregor has came in and he is um, on his way to becoming one of the most decorated Celtic players in the history of the club as well, Colin. I mean, that will be added to hopefully this Sunday in the League Cup. We've got Pete McGee, you're watching on YouTube. If anybody else is watching on there and you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel. Uh, the channel is growing uh, day by day, week by week, and we are adding uh, new strings to the bow with things like um, live events, for example. The blog is back up and running, Colin. Mm -hmm. And there's various other things planned for the channel. Pete McGee, a full strength Celtic is all well and good, but we have to show up. Losing to them in the semi and last time out at the Snake Pit, we didn't play to the best of our abilities, full strength or not. I'm glad he said Snake Pit because you know when people go on about Castle Grayskull, yeah, Castle Grayskull was the good guys. Castle, it was it was Snake Mountain that was the bad guys. All right, so well done, Pete McGee. I think he's got a good point. How many times have we really performed since Ange came in against Rangers, Colin? I think the games at Celtic Park, we certainly have. Um, away from home, some of the performances we do, um, we do kind of lack that impetus going forward. Um, I mean, we, we absolutely annihilated them last season in the two games at Celtic Park. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, the game, the 3-0 game, that was a complete turning point for our season as well. Mm -hmm. um, look, Hamden is a place where I don't think we start games very well. I don't know if that's to do with the pitch or what it is, but I haven't really seen us starting a game pretty well there. You saw even Kilmarnock were having a, a go at us in the semi-final. So we have to be on the ball on Sunday. We have to go out. We have to pin them back. Uh, we, we have to play to our strengths and attack their weaknesses. And I would say their weaknesses is definitely down the flanks. Um, as many goals as Tavernier gets, whether it be penalties, free kicks or anything else the referee wants to assist him with, um, I don't think he's a very good defender. And I think you have to pin him back, make sure that he doesn't get forward. Um, and they have been, as much as I say they don't concede a lot of goals, they have been conceding some bad ones this season. So we have to test that defence. Um, and we've got the attacking playing. I think at times against them in the game at Snake Mountain, as they said, um, we found ourselves pinned too far back. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that outball. So it'll be interesting to see if we can keep them back um, and keep them in their own half. I think that's what works really well, especially when we're at Celtic Park. If you take a look at the, the games that we're talking about, the 4-0 this season, 3-0 last season, we are in their faces, we are pinning them back. 
And that seems to be where we get the success. So we have to look at that as to something we can do going forward again. We have to capitalise on the mistakes and we have to take our chances. Um, and we are starting to take that more and more often now. We're scoring on average something like 3.2 goals a game in the league. Um, in the cup, we're averaging about four goals a game. Look, I'm not going to say they're going to score two or three, but if we keep that up, I mean, eventually we will we'll break through that defence and we'll, we'll get what we need. But the occasion, hopefully it doesn't get to the players. Mm-hmm. Um, I think obviously this is going to be an interesting one, as you say, for the likes of Rio Hitati, um, guys like O, and guys that never played in the, the cup final last year because it's going to be a 50-50 split. So we do have to turn up. We do need to drum it into everyone. And I think Callum McGregor will do that. He will get into the heads of everybody and explain how important this game is going to be. And the fans can do their bit as well, because you know at times the fans can really drive the players on. Well, I found it quite interesting to uh, read the comments made by Chris Julian who was talking about his Celtic career, some of the highs and the lows. And uh, one thing that he did point out um, is, A, the buzz that you get from Callum McGregor giving you the, the chat in the, in the huddle, and he also mentioned Bruni, uh, but also the uh, the impact of the fans behind you, Colin. I mean, yeah. he did, and I don't think he's using it as an excuse because we have spoken long and hard about the season where um, we lost the 10 in a row and Neil Lennon, um, left the club. We've spoken so much about it and all the different reasons, and there were, you know, a multitude of reasons. And he spoke about the importance of the fans and the fact that they weren't there to give us that lift. Um, and obviously, they will be there this weekend. But yeah, you're right. It's a it's a new experience for some of these players, players who we've known now for over a year. Um, yep. But it's unusual that they've not actually played in a cup final yet for Celtic. So you're looking to the likes of Callum McGregor. You're also looking to the likes of Greg Taylor. You spoke about. Uh, their right back not being a great defender. I tell you what, Greg Taylor is developing into one of our finest players. Um, and I think one of the most important players in the squad, watching back the game this morning, he was involved in the first three goals. Um, I don't think he'll get an assist for any of them, but he was involved in all three of the goals. Um, we were talking about him last week, obviously, you and I with Jackie, um, who represents Greg Taylor? Yep. Um, we were talking about how well he's taken to this new position, the inverted fullback. Do you think he's the most improved player under Ange? And now I don't mean I, I wouldn't include the likes. What I'm talking about is guys who are at Celtic. So I wouldn't include the likes of Hatati in that or, or O'Reilly players that we had at the club that Ange has come in and revitalised. Do you think he's the most improved? It will be a pretty close race between him and Ralston. You'd have to say. I mean. Greg Taylor had a career at Celtic, whereas Ralston was pretty much out the door. Uh, his contract had run out. Nobody really thought he was going to get a chance. Um, and then he comes in and shows how important he is to the squad. Um, so, yeah. And the fact that both of them are fullbacks says a lot about Ange and his style of play. Um, so, I think between the two of them, you would have a pretty close vote on who people think has been the most improved player. Um, a lot of people would maybe also say Callum McGregor in that as well because he came under a lot of criticism in the behind closed season, season uh, behind closed doors season. Um, Is that what we're calling it now? Because I, I, what did I call it? The season we lost the 10. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, I don't want to look at it that way, Paul. You nah, know? I, I think you're right, yeah. So no mentions of Rolls Royces when you're talking about players. And no uh, mentions okay. of losing the 10 when we're talking about the closed the doors season. Right, okay. That's the that's one. Closed doors season. Because um, if you say the other C word, then it starts a conspiracy theory. Depends what C word you're not. talking about. Yeah, well, that's true, but we're not up for that today. Um, McGregor took a bit of criticism for that season as well. That's going back to the banner the other week. <laughs> uh, sorry. He did, um, he did. So some people might say that as well. James Forrest has come on to a game. Um, yeah, but I'd definitely say it's between Taylor and Ralston for the most improved player since Ange came in. He's been brilliant. Taylor has been superb. Um, and I mean, we're going to talk about potential lineups because Ange may well have a full complement of players at his disposal. Like you said earlier, he spoke about Moy and Turnbull starting to train early in the week, Tuesday. Um, and if that's the case and they're fit, it's a brilliant selection headache for him, Colin. Yeah, 100%. Um, for me, I'm, I'm sitting looking at who the 11 would be. 
I think if you take a look back to the game at Ibrox, um, Moy was really missing out that team. We couldn't really bring the ball down. We couldn't keep control of the, the ball. Um, and I think Moy offers that, which means you would push Hitati one for further forward. But then you have to drop O'Reilly, who I thought he had a fairly decent game on uh, Saturday. And he obviously did very well when he came off the bench against um, St Mirren. But you're looking at that as... You look at the bench and you're going, we now have so many options that can come on and change a game. How many times did you look at a bench last season or even the seasons before and you're going, oh, there's not really many options here. Whereas now you're like, most of that bench would be star players in every single team in this league. I mean, you look at like a badder coming off the bench, potentially a Riley, O, a Forrest, players of that ilk, it's just unbelievable the, the strength and depth we've got just now um, and it can only be good for the first team as well because you know you have to be on your game to keep your jersey Absolutely. and you don't see many players having poor games because of that you see some of the players that have fallen off the edge they're not even in the squad you know Stephen yeah. Welsh played the first game of the season scored the first goal of the season first I think. Scored, yeah right. scored first goal yeah played really well not even in the squad, James McCarthy, not in the squad. So, yeah, you do really need to be turning up every single time you get your opportunity. There's a couple of others I'm going to throw into that mix as well. But before I do that, let's get some thoughts from you, the viewers. John Sweeney, welcome back. You're watching on YouTube. And you'll need to be clever on Sunday as the only way we can get beat is having a man sent off and the yellow <laughs> cards will be dished out to Celtic and we have five subs. Oh, no, Again, did you not, sorry, Paul, to interrupt. Did you not hear? There's a bit of jiggery-pokery going on. Oh, Jiggery Poker, I did hear Yeah, that. Did, did you hear that? Yeah, about how um, Celtic of what was it, 143 fouls Celtic have committed in 14 games and get nine yellow cards, whereas Rangers have conceded 144 fouls for 30 yellow cards. So, I mean, the referees are clearly on our side, Paul. I mean, there's some Jiggery Poker going on there. Oh, absolutely. And again, I've got to say, unless somebody clips that and, and puts it out on a tweet, I don't see that kind of stuff because I don't listen to that show. But you always kind of keep up to track with what's happening, Colin, because some good soul out there will clip it and put it on Twitter. And that's yeah, how I get my name. Was, he, he was shot down very, very aptly by uh, Andrew McLean and by Hugh Kevens, which was yeah. it was a joy to hear, actually. Jiggery, pokery, only in Scotland. Michael Fern, love Colin, but where's Jim? We getting them on soon. Jim normally appears every second Friday. Uh, that might have been disrupted a wee bit because he's been busy with his play bender like Berry, which was excellent, by the way. Um, if, you, if you do get an opportunity to see any of these upcoming plays, there might be an announcement soon. Um, but I'm not going to be making it. Then go along and see it because Jim's humour comes out to play on the stage. It's fantastic. I like the fact him. I actually know what this announcement is as well. It's one of the few times I'm I'm in with it. The knowledge here. I, ITK. Uh, <laughs> Keith Oakden, hello again from Plymouth. Well done. I, I'm glad that you're able to tune in. Um, you see a lot of regular names. It's also great to see the new names coming in and making their feelings known. Disagree with us. Agree with us. That's what we do as a team as well because Kevin Graham and I have had a few ding-dongs along the, along the last five and a half years, Colin. We didn't agree on everything, but that's what it's all about. Met Kevin um, before the game on Saturday. Him and his him? Daughter, yeah, him and his daughter were going to the game. Um, she looked Axel, so, Axel, so team members actually to go to games. Was I know it's, it's hard to believe, but she looked as fed up with, with him as what I've seen some people in the comment section. So, was he reciting the book? Was he standing on a soapbox? No, no, he should have been, but I mean, we could have done that and get the old hat out. Just <laughs> for a... <laughs> the thing is, if he wanted to come in and answer us, he, he could just log in and come up because he's he obviously could. one of the admins on this. Um, a couple of the players I wanted to mention, you were talking about those who come off the bench. Uh, you look at the bench and it's really strong. I've been talking about those who, like Haksabanovic comes on, as did uh, Awata at the weekend, and they get about half an hour each. And I think you look at Awata's performance, really composed, Colin. You know, yep. willing to get into space, always looking for the ball. I like what I've seen so far, although it's been in, in very small um, moments and small cameos. Haksabanovic is a player that I think uh, we and others were quite excited about and then he had the illness and the injury and it's almost as if he's building himself back up now. And again, he only had half an hour, but he played, he got an assist for the fourth goal. I like his direct play. Um, I think he's a player that's got a lot to kind of prove 
uh, because he was one of these guys who, you know, he was a prodigy, he came in as a teenager, got a big move to England, didn't work out. And I think he's got a point to prove and hopefully he can prove it at Celtic. But you've got a group of players there that, you know, throw in Kobayashi um, as well. These are guys that really want to make an impression in the second half of the season, Colin. And we've not seen a great deal of a couple of these guys yet. And that, I think that's quite exciting in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Hak Sabanovic did very, very well when he came off the bench on Saturday. Um, very unlucky not to get a goal himself. Does extremely well for the fourth goal. Um, shows his, his strength to win the, the ball back um, and puts a great cross in for Abada, who's another one who's came off the bench and uh, had done really well. There was a, there was a great point I, I heard... Um, the other week, when's the last time we saw three players come off the bench and score a goal like we did against St Mirren? Mm. I mean, that's showing the strength and depth that we've got in this this squad. It's, yeah. It is fantastic. I mean, it must be so heartbreaking for um, other teams if you've played 60 minutes, 70 minutes, absolutely knocked your pan in, and then you look and see who's coming on, and it's like Safak Sabanovic, Abada, um, even Turnbull O'Reilly when they came off the bench and stretching the game even even more. Um, that's why we score so many late goals. You see people saying, "Oh, Celtic, even in the eighth minute, they're never beat." That's because these players are coming off the bench and they've got ninety minutes in them, but we only need them for thirty. Mm-hmm. And that's why you've got and saying we don't stop because he is constantly using the bench to. St- uh, strength to put on players that are going to keep going, whether it's two minutes added on by the ref or it's ten minutes added on, they're going to keep going to the final whistle and that's what you want to see and it's why kind of, I know there's so many people who's got different excuses, but people that leave early are running the risk of missing one, two, maybe even three goals with a Celtic team. Yeah, there's a few things that are crossing my mind when you, you were chatting there about this never stop mentality because it's been kind of made famous. It's been the slogan that's been used since Ange came in, Colin. But I remember the centenary season, which is a special season to myself, being the first time that I went to Celtic Park in the pre-season of that campaign. And that was a massive that was a massive feature of that season, the late goals. And, you know, when you're introduced to Celtic and that's what you do, you, get, you kind of get used to that as being a factor in how Celtic perform. You know, that never-die attitude. And then you start doing a bit of research, you look back in the, the great team in, in Lisbon who were famed for being the fittest in Europe. You know, yeah. they, they ran into Milan off the park. Um, and you go a wee bit further back when, when Neely Mockham was actually given the role as, as trainer at Celtic. Um, it, it specified what his role was, and that was to make them the fittest team in the country. Is that when it started? Is that when we became this team that never stopped? It was that wee bit fitter that started getting late goals? I'd need to look... I'd need to look a wee bit further into that. But I always look back in the centenary season and thought that was part of the mantra back then. And it's certainly part of this team's mantra as well. Yeah, and the, the thing is, it's for fans, it's certainly encouraging to see because we go back, and I don't want to dwell too much on it, but that behind closed door season, um, we spoke about how after 60 minutes, if Celtic weren't winning, there was trouble because they seemed to run out of steam. They seemed to run out of ideas um, whereas with this Celtic team it's it is generally non-stop for 90 minutes it's not there's never a point where you're sitting there going yeah we've kind of took our foot off the gas and even when we do um, we still have the ability to put the ball in the back of the net whereas beforehand it was something that was sort of disheartening as a Celtic fan is to see what happened after 60 minutes so Credit to Ange and to the sports scientists and to all the coaches at, at Celtic for what they've managed to do in such a short period of time uh, to turn that around because it's, it's really worked and it's it's playing to our advantage. We're scoring the most goals in the first 15 minutes and we're scoring the most goals in the last 15 minutes. And that's the two biggest points of the game, in my opinion. thing is, Greg Taylor was asked about it after the game and um, he was asked the question, is it the manager and, and the staff or is it the players or is it a combination of both? And I think what happens is once it becomes a behaviour and it becomes part of the fabric, then it's it's been instilled in the culture. I mean, somebody can stand there and tell you this is what I want, but until it's actually lived out and it's part of the behaviour of the team, 
Colin. It's no part of the culture of being a Celtic player. And then what you get is other guys coming into the this environment where it's unacceptable to do anything other than that. And then that culture continues. And thankfully, it's been reignited. Because like you say, in that forgettable season, um, we were all out of ideas. Uh, nothing we could do in terms of a change would, would uh, you know, remedy that. And then it ended up with players trying the luck from 25 to 30 yards to try and make the breakthrough. And you're smiling because you're thinking of a very specific player at that time. Now, Strachan's laptop reminds us Rio got man of the match on his debut. He did, and he had that phenomenal performance against Rangers shortly thereafter as well. Jerry uh, Orawi stopped trying to sell her tatty. The media will do that. I don't know if that's a conversation in the comments section. But one of, one of the um, conversations we've been having, we started having it, on the weekend there with Kevin McCluskey was the fact that we talk about Andy's aspirations as a, a European team, what he wants to achieve in Europe. Um, and what does European success look like for Celtic? And I know I'm jumping forward a wee bit. We've got a League Cup final to win on Sunday. Um, but my, my kind of view on that, Colin, is it all comes down to recruitment with Celtic. Mm -hmm. Because what you and I did a while back, you and I were waiting in the toll booth in Stirling when we used to record the podcast back in the day. And the guest who was coming to join us at that afternoon couldn't make it, you'll remember. Yeah. So what we did, because we had booked the studio time, is we spoke about our own personal Celtic teams of the decade. If you were to look at the last 10 years, who would make it into the team? It was just something we had to do off the cuff because the guest never turned up. But it got me thinking that in the last decade, if you go back to 2013, right up to date, you could probably assemble a team of players who, at their peak, if assembled at their peak, would do something in Europe. Who knows what that, that would look like? Um, so it's not as though Celtic can't attract or develop the players. It's about doing it in a shorter space of time, Colin. And it's about doing it over a period of half a dozen transfer windows rather than half a dozen years and keeping them, hopefully, for the half a dozen transfer windows so that the team can develop together. And that was the point I was trying to make. But the biggest challenge in doing that is keeping a hold of guys like Hatati. Yep. and O'Reilly and Carter Vickers and Jota and all these other guys because it's a matter of time. You, you know, you play well for half a, half a season in Scotland. Certain clubs are going to be interested. You start turning on Europe. Even bigger and richer clubs are going to get interested. Um, so, yeah, we're not certainly trying to sell a tatty. I want to, I want to keep them. Um, and I want Ange to have, um, you know, a number of good transfer windows from here on in that will give them a better chance of doing something in the Champions League. Because I think it, recruitment's key. And by the time you get to the fifth or the sixth transfer window, Colin, the guys, if you've still got them, that you brought in in the first, they've developed in, you know, into the way that Ange wants them to play. They've got the mentality. They've got the you know, the culture uh, already instilled in them. And I think that's the only way we're going to make that impact in Europe. Yeah, I mean, we're back to what served us best in the sort of successful period um, where we were challenging the likes of Barcelona and the Champions League, we're getting to the last 16. We're back to that era where it might not... <sighs> we're looking at projects, but the projects are slightly different. I mean, when you look at the projects we had in recent years, it was guys like Bio and Klamala and guys that didn't really set the header alight even in the leagues that they were in beforehand. Um, and it was almost taking a risk that, do you know what, he's only two and a half million, let's turn it around, we'll get 10 million. That didn't really happen because we were living off the past of picking up guys like Virgil van Dijk for 2.3 million, Gary Hooper for two and a half million, Joe Ledley on a three. Um, and it was almost a sort of dry period in the market where we couldn't attract these players to the club anymore. And the players that we were attracting just they weren't up to the standard. So when you pick up a Dimbelli for five hundred grand, or you pick up Fraser Foster on his seventeenth loan deal or whatever it might have been, it is important to get the most out of them to reinvest properly. And we weren't reinvesting properly. You, you take a look at the money we wasted on the likes of Barkas and a Yeti and guys of that ilk, and now we're spending money and. Even the projects are cheaper, but they're coming in with the understanding that Ange already knows the knowledge about them. He's got an insight into how they play and how they can come in and suit his style of football. 
Mm-hmm. I think we were just taking a punt before. We were absolutely just taking a punt. I mean, how many players did you really see that the likes of Brendan Rodgers would say, I don't really know an awful lot about him? The we, don't, of, we don't need Manny another winger. Yeah. yeah. Or he was available and we needed a player in that position, so we picked him up in the likes of Malumbu. So it's good to see that Ange's, Ange always speaks about being a transfer window ahead. And I think at Celtic, we were almost like a transfer window behind. Um, we would almost go into January trying to fix what we couldn't do in the summer. Yeah. So if we needed a right back, we'd bring someone in and it would be short term like John Joe Kenny and he would come in for six months. You're dropping or, all the big names today, by the way. <laughs> I'm just waiting or, for uh, Timu Puki to come in. I think Timu Puki was gone before he actually fully settled, to be perfectly honest. Skepovich. Uh, yeah, guys, but when you look at it, we're now spending money properly. We're back to the transfer strategy that's worked extremely well for us. We make a profit in transfers now. Mm-hmm. Not that that's the narrative that the Scottish media want to run with, but we do. Um, and it's it's benefiting us. We've now got a squad of players who we give them a chance when they come to Celtic. They've got the chance to show their, their worth on a great stage. And when they do well, they know that there will be an opportunity if they choose to do so to further their career somewhere else where they can make themselves a lot of money that will see them out for the rest of their career. I hope that um, that combination of players who, if all playing together, would do something you know, um, progressive in the Champions League happens while Stange Postacoglu is at the club. And I agree with you. I think that we are now a transfer window ahead, whereas we were always running behind. And often the January was a stopgap transfer window. Yeah. But also, Colin, I think that we're not just taking players that are presented to us, you know, be that from... Um, a particular agent, for example, we're, we're, do we we're do doing, that, we're doing the recruitment. You know, we're looking further afield. I think there might have been a complacency that crept in during the years that you're talking about, where we were dominant. We weren't really going to, unless something catastrophic happened, we weren't going to lose the league for a period of time there, right? So we were bringing players in who weren't really the the kind of right fit. And that's why so many of them didn't work out. Um, and instead of players being presented to us, I think we're doing our recruitment a lot better. Uh, we're tapping into markets that we weren't looking at before. And obviously, there's a level of control, I think, that the gaffer's got now with regards to transfers that some of the previous managers didn't have. And I think that's huge as well. Um, Francis McDonald, nice to see Brooke Combe on Soccer AM on Saturday. Some, some might say... We knew something about music. Others might say anyone with a set of ears would have known that Brooke Combe is going to smash it. She was absolutely tremendous. And um, I think she's going to be huge, Colin. I thought you were going to just try and throw as many Oasis puns in there as possible. Did I do that? Or Some did I do that? Or, you know, I we could have. I could have kept that one going. No, but you're right. In, in a couple of weeks before that, not nothing to do with us, Mick Head was on, on Soccer AM. Um, and then I just seen, I think it was yesterday on Radio X, that the Chase were on there. So these were all bands that were in our studio um, or on the show over the last year or so. Yeah. And they're all doing excellently well. JJI, to be fair to heart, this is going back to Danielle's point. So let's talk about it. Did he not receive a high order of a pass back? Right. Let's talk about then the defensive discipline that Tom Boyd was talking about during the game, Colin. You, you I don't think I've seen the game. Uh, televised, you were at the game. Yep. Tom Boyd was talking about how the mentality has to be spot on, not just for the goalie, but for the defenders. I think the defenders are well enough involved in the game that it's not as big an issue. It must creep into it sometimes with Joe Hart. And as Daniel said earlier, there was a bit of a heart and mouth moment. Is it a concern for you? If it was a closer game, it would have been more of a concern. Um, and it wasn't just one, he had two or three to be perfectly honest, um, that was like that in the second half. Uh, and we did, we, we got away with them. Um, in the first half, he actually did it quite successfully and it helped continue the attack. And I think that's that's part of what I'm just trying to drill in is that everyone's involved in the attack. It can be the goalkeeper, it can be the, the centre-backs. I saw a stat yesterday and it's that um, Kevin and Carter Vickers has played just over 2,000 minutes of football in the league mm-hmm. for Celtic and in that time he successfully completed over 1800 passes now that's like almost a pass a minute for a centre back to 
be on the ball that frequently in a team that's attacking constantly. It shows how much every single player has their part to play in the games. You take a look at the recovery um, on Saturday and how quick the ball came back. It would go to the Aberdeen forward, they'd lose out to Starfield or Cameron Carter-Vickers, the ball would go wide and would start again. And it is really... Um, what did the commentators call that? Recycling it? Recycling the ball, yeah. Yeah, as, as well as getting a shot off as well. But uh, <laughs> all, all these terms um, have crept the, in. The only thing I would like to see us do maybe a bit more that we don't seem to do is distribute the ball and sort of miss someone out. I think there's always like that extra oh, pass we could cut out. Um, you see the yeah. likes of Maeda and Jota on the wings. We've got the ability to do it. We've seen it every now and again from the likes of Carter Vickers and stuff out where they'll play the sort of long ball. Jens uh, was a fan of it. Yeah, very much. And mm-hmm. it would catch out the defences. I think with the pace that we've got, it would help us get in behind as well. Um, apart from that, it is very melodic watching Celtic because there's the sort of pass move, pass move, split the defence, goal. Um, and you can almost see that every goal takes at least 30, 40 passes at times, unless we're on the counter where it can be as little as three or four. Um, but they do have the patience and it's almost like watching uh, Pep Guardiola's Barcelona at times, where they would just constantly recycle the ball and go again. Um, and Celtic continue to do that. So I would like to see us try that sort of different pass to sort of try and catch out the defence. But the fact, as I said, Cameron Carter Vickers and Starfield were on the ball so much. It just shows how important they are to that defence. And I think if you look at Joe Hart as well, and you can maybe take a look at his stats, you see that the ball will come back to him and he'll pass the ball out. He'll play the ball out to the, the wing. And he is part of the attack as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. CJ has been saying all season that uh, Hatati is the best since Petrov, what a player Petrov was. Um, and also we've got uh, Celtic followers saying that it's the vision that stands out with us. He sees a pass before a lot of other people. He sees things that um, others don't see. Uh, he does. As as that. And when you look at the, the forwards and how the the sort of movement they've got, a lot of people say that Kyogo plays on the shoulder of the last defender. I think O's done that a couple of times as well since he's came in. Um, Jota and Maeda both do the same finding that player who makes that move is almost as important as the player making the move in the first place and as I said we sort of of play that extra pass maybe and it means that the player doesn't get onto the end of the ball because the run goes unnoticed Mm -hmm. but Maeda, if you look at some of Kyogo's best goals this season where he's got in behind, 9 times out of 10 it's Maeda or O'Reilly um, that's playing that pass because they've got the intelligence to know where Kyogo's going to be and play him in. And that's the reason why he's got so many goals this season. The end of season highlights uh, reel is going to be impressive. I don't know if the club will still release it on DVD as they have been up to this point, Colin, but it will definitely be something uh, to enjoy. Now, Pete McGee, Hatati reminds me of Luka Modric. I heard a lot of people over the weekend saying, Remember we signed Maravchik and everybody was saying, oh, I wish we'd signed Maravchik 10 years before we did. And people are now making those comparisons. This is what you would have seen had you signed Maravchik uh, 10 years before we actually did. So there's a lot of comparisons getting thrown about and that's fair enough. Um, You made a a mention earlier of O making his first start, Colin. I actually thought he was better in the first half and I think that he tired a wee bit and I'm not surprised because I just think when players come into Andy's team, it takes him a wheel to get to that level of intensity. Um, yep. So it wasn't a concern for me. I thought, you know, as far as first starts go, um, even was it the first goal he played a part, played a part in retaining possession yep. in, in the first goal? I think he looks strong. Um, he looks hungry for goals. He, he likes to get into, um, you know, dangerous positions. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to judge him on one start. I, I think so far from what I've seen, I've been pretty impressed. You could see he was quite disappointed that he hadn't scored when he came off the park um, but there was a moment in the second half and I think it was McKenzie that was marking him um, and he just completely barged McKenzie off the ball and that showed his strength in that he could just do that. McKenzie ended up about two yards back on his backside with how strong O was 
And as I said earlier on, the fact that Oaken came in and the style of football doesn't change must be a massive benefit for Ange. Because at times... Oh, what are we doing here, Paul? No, somebody was asking about the jersey. I'm just setting myself up for when you're finished. All right, off. okay. Um, at times when Giacomakis would come in, maybe we'd change it up a bit. The crosses would go higher. We'd look for him as the out ball, whereas we just continue to play the, the style of football that we've seen um, when we've had Kyogo up front when all was playing. So it was great to see. I don't judge him off that performance. Um, I thought he did pretty well. I think he will find the back of the net for Celtic. There's lots of crosses going um, across the face of goal that maybe in a couple of weeks' time he'll get himself on the end of. But he acquitted himself very, very well. Yeah, I think so. Uh, CJ does make the point that uh, being brave enough to try those passes, you spoke about missing out the fullback, Colin, going straight to the winger. Yeah. I thought Jens did it particularly well with Haksabanovic. He seemed to like uh, bringing him into the play. But yeah, they are they are a riskier pass. Does Starfield have that long-range pass? I'm not sure. I think Carter Vickers does. Um, but yeah, they're, they're obviously playing under instruction as well. And maybe that's not part of the, the game plan unless... We're at a certain point of a game and we need to try and uh, get in behind the defence. Martin Johnson asked about this jersey. Yeah, it is a match one one worn by none other than Malky Mackay, who that day wore number 14. It's a long sleeve, which you couldn't get back in the day. And that was worn in Mike Galloway's benefit game, which was Celtic versus a Celtic All-Stars team, which included Kenny Dalgleish, Roy Aiken, Chris Morris, uh, Anton Rogan, and many others. You'd need to check up on the Celtic Wiki for the full lineup. O'Reilly back in. You say no, Colin. You would start with Moy if he's fit. Yeah, I think my midfield three on Sunday, if they're all fit, would be Hatati, Moy, and McGregor. Um, and I think once again, obviously, um, O'Reilly coming off the bench gives us something if we're still trying to change the game after 60, 70 minutes. Mm -hmm. I think it's a difficult uh, decision because, you know, after the event, it's great to say, oh, we should have played Moy against Rangers last time round, right? Um, and on this occasion, if we use that as the as the, the gauge and we say, oh, well, you know, it didn't work last time, let's bring Moy back. You rush him in because he's obviously not been fit to, to start the game at the weekend or even sit on the bench. O'Reilly's played okay. I think he's played pretty well in the mm. game and a bit that he's played. You can't really win if you're Ange because either way there's going to be an argument to say you got it wrong. Does that mean he's got to send flowers to the wives of the players that's not playing and console the ones that aren't playing as well? I could make the tea. I'm good at that. I'm good at making a cup of tea. Um, now, the League Cup officials, as I was saying at the beginning of the, the show, that's not something that should be part of the discussion, Colin. It should be almost irrelevant. But if you see the amount of comments that have come in, and rightly so, um, it's almost as big a concern as the team that we're facing at the weekend. Are you concerned? I, I'm not. I'm not. I think, unfortunately, as poor as his performances are, he's actually one of the better ones out of the the referees or the refereeing pool that we've got just now. And that's not really saying much because my thoughts, and I've said this several times on here, is that the standard of refereeing in Scottish football was absolutely appalling. Um, look, I think it was Jock Steen that says you can only beat what's in front of you. Um, and if the referees are against you, forget about it. You've got to beat them as well. And if Celtic are good enough, they will beat them. So I just think that we've got to keep playing to our game. Yeah, there might be decisions that go against us. I think we've got to play to the whistle as well. There was a couple of times on... Saturday we didn't do that, it was quite frustrating um, but it's just keeping keeping it as simple as possible just continue to play the style of football that we play and everything else will come if the, if you don't give them the opportunity to uh, make a decision against you, then there's nothing to worry about my, my big worry I've got to say is and it was mentioned earlier, if you've got one of the situations where it's a right tight game Colin, we know with the Cups and we have played Ranger sides on Durange where it's been a tight game and it's just one of those decisions, you know, one of those moments where we're waiting on a decision coming uh, back and you're just thinking it's going to go the other way. 
that you do, you go into these games because of what we've seen. And I don't want to be saying that there's jiggery pokery. I don't want to be that guy. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of concern in the comment section. Let's hope we're not talking about it after the game. That's the big thing. Um, I mean, you take a look back to the last cup final against them. Mm-hmm. Frimpong gives the guy the decision to make. He brings the, the ball, he brings the, the player down, the decision's there to sort of um, give them a penalty. Foster obviously makes a fantastic save. But if you don't give them the opportunity to make those decisions, then it should be at least taking that worry out of the equation. If we just continue to play and don't do anything stupid, then you'll not have to worry about it. That I, I still don't know how we won that game. I mean, El Yunusi played for the first 40 minutes with a moon boot on, I think. Yeah. We get a sending off. They miss a penalty. Didn't we start with Lewis Morgan up top? Yeah, uh, Edward totally changed that game when he came uh, on. Yeah. Totally and of changed. course, the aforementioned Chris Julien scores the goal that wins the cup. And um, we had a wee discussion before we go into it. Arthur Boric is 43 today. Wow. He's looking good for it. Uh, 221 appearances for Celtic he spent 5 years at Parkhead or Celtic Park or Paradise whatever you like to call it but none of the others Um, 3 league titles 1 Scottish Cup 2 league cups won by Arthur Boric favourite Boric moment Colin Watt the flag at Ibrox it has to be doesn't it Um, no seriously though um, the save against Spartak Moscow to put us through into the, the Champions League group stage what a moment what a night that was um, he was just outstanding. He showed on so many occasions how good a goalkeeper he was. But he <laughs> he was one of those goalkeepers that definitely didn't have the full shilling. Um, he made some. I knew somebody. Was, I knew somebody was going to say it. Parkles, I knew it. Uh, Joseph, I knew it. Um, he made some bad mistakes. I think back to like. Um, yeah, I was thinking that penalty save as well, but also the mistakes he made was it against Hibs, Easter Road, yeah. at Easter Road, and yep. stuff like that. But no, the, the, he was a great character. Um, he was so important in that side as well. Uh, and again, I go back to that night against Spartak Moscow, and as we dance after he saves the the last penalty, and everyone piles on top of him, and you see that um, there's that picture where. The late Tommy Burns is running over to celebrate with him as well. It's it's one of those iconic Celtic moments. Ah, definitely. Tell me about it, wee Jimmy. Uh, 43 ain't old these days. You're right. Uh, he's younger than me. Listen, these are the kind of moments that, that spring to mind. You're right, that wee dance, brilliant, superb. Yeah. The, the goal against United, was it 9-8? The, the, oh, the I think it was, it was like 9-8. 11 or something like that, I think. Ah, yeah, you're right. I'm thinking 9-8. I'm thinking the 1990 Scottish Cup final. Yeah, he uh, scores and then Willow Flood misses and signs yeah, for Celtic like two That's days right. later. <laughs> That's right. We um, envelope there. <laughs> well, well, well. Um, he played with his heart, but not with his head. He was the absolute model of what a cult hero is, because he had the skill, but he had that side of his game as well. Gordon Stratton tells the story about him having a cigarette at half time in the cubicle. Maybe could find him. He's in there having yeah. a drag. Yeah, so he's 43 today, and as it was already said by Wee Jimmy, that's no age at all. He's in the prime of his life. Did you um, ever hear the story of him and Aidan McGeady in the changing room? Is that when he battered them? Aye. <laughs> Chased them about for something. They were arguing, at, I think it was at Tyne Castle. Mm-hmm. They were arguing over something coming off the park, and then Aidan basically had to hide in the changing room because Big Arthur was after him. What a character. A pal of mine was in the same block of apartments um, as Arthur Boric when he stayed in Glasgow. And let's just say it was uh, something of a party haven whilst <laughs> Arthur was in town. Uh, the Celtic end, you've not had a chance to talk about that. We spoke, obviously, to one of the um, persons involved. Martin came on the show on Friday to chat about their uh, initiative. Sounds great, Colin. Um, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, overall, I think the, the project sounds encouraging. Um, you've got to admit the atmosphere that's generated by the yellow wall um, at Dortmund is phenomenal. I actually saw that um, the yellow wall, it was the first time, I think, during the week when they played in the Champions League that they've been able to have the full capacity of the yellow wall Mm -hmm. uh, because they do the whole, I think it's one and a half people per seat in the, the standing sections in Germany, whereas they had it down to 
basically one for one by the UEFA regulations. So that was that was incredible seeing that. I think there is a demand for fans that want to stand at football. You see it, we must be the only support that has two sections that want to do it already. Mm-hmm. You've got obviously the North Curve and you've got the boys section, which has vastly expanded um, since they moved from 444 to the wee section that they're in just now. Um, I, they had some fans over from uh, Paris Saint-Germain at the weekend as well, I saw. Um, but they, they have a bigger section there. Whether they'll be able to incorporate the Celtic end right away, I think it's very ambitious. But I'm not sure how quick that can be done. Um, there's a lot of people who... And by the way, just because you've got a season ticket at Celtic Park, it doesn't make it your seat, right? I, I totally understand that it's like, oh, I've sat here since 95, since they opened the stadium and blah, blah, blah. The, it's We don't own it. We sort of rent it off Celtic every single season. Um, and people have moved before. They've moved to accommodate the, the North Curve. So I don't really understand that argument about it. I'm sure there'd be... There will be an I mean, argument, though. Oh, there will be an argument, but yeah, I mean, I don't think there's necessarily, unless you're stuck behind one of the pillars, there's a bad view of Celtic Park. Um, but I, th- I think the natural thing would really be to um, increase the north north curve at first. Um, whether so that it may happen, even, it may happen stages. Yeah, but I don't think it will be behind the the Celtic goal. And as the way things are happening at the minute you won't see Rangers ever returning to getting that 8,000 allocation of what they already got um, just because of the sort of dummies that have been spat out. So if you continue to work your way around, I think it will be um, something along those lines. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to stand at the football. You don't have to stand. There is seating available there for you as well. Not saying that it's going to be great because maybe someone in front of you is standing, but it's, it's sort of you can't dictate what other people are going to do. Um, yeah, it's I don't see as taking the whole um, Jockstein stand and turning it into a yellow wall, but it would be it would be nice to see um, a green and white wall. Yeah, uh, but I don't know if you you saw was it River Plate in Argentina? They've got a a new mm. st- stadium or something that they've built. And it was yeah. a full standing section. There was no barriers. I did see that. There was people just standing at the edge. Oh, it made me feel sick watching it. No, I did see that. Um, a few more comments before we wrap it up this afternoon. Uncle Nobby Steamboat loved the Holy Goalie. I think a lot of us did. Uh, Mark Tyler is doing a great um, project at the moment, actually, using the Celtic jersey book where he's travelling from stadium to stadium, getting in touch with ex celts getting them to sign their jerseys, etc. in the book. It looks fantastic. And he points out here that Arthur's playing for the Legends at Anfield. That is Saturday. Is it Saturday? Uh, yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Aye. Aye. We're going to have representation at that game, actually. Uh, praise accreditation. So hopefully we can get a wee chat with some of the Legends as well. Um, JGI, his jazz hand celebration. Brilliant. I always think I'm thinking about it right now as I speak. And God bless the Pope. Absolutely, Paul Diet. Um, it was one of these things that seemed to rattle a lot of people when um, the Roman Catholic Arthur Boric was blessing himself and wearing uh, the Polish Pope's image on his t shirt. I don't know why it would annoy anybody. And Tony Cassidy, uh, lead you on megaphone at Mordor. Another name for Snake Mountain, Tony. Thank you for that. <laughs> but I do remember he came. Um, and led, what, what do you call it? Capo, are you the capo when you've got the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, so he was the capo of the ultras there at uh, Ibrox Stadium. Listen, I've really enjoyed that. There's a few other topics, but I'm sure we'll, we'll cover them as the week progresses. Uh, Colin, what has been an absolute pleasure once again. Will you join us on, on Thursday if we get a wee special guest? Uh, we'll see. I mean, I think, I think the guest I've, seen a, I've seen a couple of <laughs> people in the comment section fed up, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. 
fed up with the sight of you. That's not yeah. nice. Um, it's been a really good show. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. How do you help a Celtic state of mind grow? The first thing, the simplest thing, give us a wee thumbs up on the YouTube video. Uh, make a comment, if you wish, on the YouTube video. Subscribe to the channel. These things help the algorithm and helps us to pop up in recommendations and all that kind of stuff. We do go out live every single weekday at 12.30. We cover all the games as well, and we are working on fully produced material, um, which is that wee bit more polished. Uh, than the live stream stuff that we put out on a daily basis. We've got to thank every single one of you for supporting us. If you want to come along and see us live, there's some ticket links underneath this video. The boys from Seville 20 years ago, Colin, 20 years ago we went to Seville in the UEFA Cup final. Alan Thompson is joining us to talk to us all about that at Gracie's. If you want a ticket, there are still some available. It will sell out like all the others. And the ticket link is underneath. All that's left for me to say, Colin Watt, thank you for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>